So there you have it, the five best and worst places to build a house or village. So where are the best and worst places to build your house or village from the permaculture perspective? I had a ton of comments asking that question after my recent video called This Farm Design Can Heal the Planet, linked here above. So here's my response and I hope it helps. Number five, at the slope break. The slope break is where the slope changes from steep to gentle. We find many examples of traditional villages, towns, and settlements placed there for a number of reasons. First off, the slope break is often the change between two different ecosystems, whether it's between forest and meadow, or places where tree crops are grown and where field agriculture happens. For subsistence farmers and hunters, being at the break between these two types of environments gives access to two totally different ecosystems with different plant, animal, and soil types. So you can hunt game and collect mushrooms in the forest in one direction and grow corn and squash in the other. It's also the highest place in the landscape where it makes sense to collect and store water. So you have the yields and the materials of the forest above, a water supply at the settlement level, and flatter land down below in the valley for crops. Perfect, right? But what about the worst place in this landscape? If you watch my video, Permaculture Design for Wildfire Defense, linked above, then you'll know that placing a house at the top of the hill or ridge is the worst place in terms of wildfire danger because fire travels up. So if you're at the top of the slope, then fire can travel up to you from any direction. You also have to build a long and possibly steep meandering road to the top, and you'll need to pump water and haul everything you need to this high point. Okay, yes, you're right, the view is beautiful, but you can make a nice trail going up there and have a comfortable bench to enjoy the view from. If you're building a fortress or a castle, then the high ground gives you a strategic advantage. But we're really talking about normal people here. Number four, the sun-facing side. Okay, this one is for people who live in temperate climates where you have a winter season which gets cold. If you're in the tropics, go ahead and skip to number three. I've previously discussed passive solar design in my video, How to Build a Permaculture Neighborhood, linked above. The sun is an incredible source of heat and light, if your home and village are placed in the correct location with the correct orientation. In the northern hemisphere, this is on a gentle south-facing slope. With the house oriented within 20 degrees east or west. If you're in the southern hemisphere, just flip the directions toward the north instead of south. See, if your home is elongated to the east and west, then in wintertime, when the sun is low on the horizon, it will strike the biggest side of your house for the maximum amount of heating and natural light. Like I said, you can shift the orientation 20 degrees in either direction and still pretty much get the full effect. Then in the summertime, when the sun is directly overhead, you'll have overhangs shielding your south-facing windows. And the smaller east and west sides of the house will be the only part that's exposed to the direct sun, where you can plant trees for shade. Now the worst place to put a house in terms of passive solar gain is at the base of a steep north-facing hill or cliff. This house will be dark and dank throughout the long winter possibly with mold problems as well as underground seepage from moisture on the north side. I'd like to point out a notable exception to this rule though, because if you live in a more arid area, the north slope may be where the water source is, and you have to sacrifice your solar access for water access. And that's a legit choice to make. When placing a house, village, or town along a river, you have to understand how a river flows because you need to know what land will go underwater and what will stay dry during a flood event. So I'm gonna give you a quick fluvial geomorphology 101. It's a good word, right? 
I want to preface this short lesson by saying that nature is really variable and the unique geology of a particular area may not follow these rules. So chill. This is a general lesson that covers most but not all landscapes. Also important to note, people have massively manipulated the natural flow of water in many areas, so the natural pattern may be obscured. See, a river bends and it deepens and scours the channels at the outside of a bend and then deposits silt and debris on the inside of the bend, sometimes creating a sandbar that you could see. A river bends back and forth in different directions, so alternates the direction of the curve. On a river bend, there's usually a high side and a low side. The high side is on the outside of the bend, and the low side is on the inside of the bend. So when the river floods, it floods the inside. So you see how my town of Corvallis, Oregon is placed on the outside of the bend in the Willamette River? And then when we go further downstream, we find the town of Albany on the outside of the bend, and further down, the town of Independence, and then the capital city of Salem, all on the outside of the bend. So the best place to place a house or town, on the high side of a river, on the outside of the bend. The worst place, you guessed it, inside the bend, otherwise known as the floodplain. Speaking of water flow, let's look at another great location for a home or village, and that is number two, above the confluence of two streams. In my travels, I have observed a lot of old homesteads, indigenous villages, and ruins placed in this position on a terrace or hill above the floodplain, yet overlooking this wonderful triangle of land, which consists of good alluvial soil that was deposited here during past floods. One nice thing about this position is that you can intercept the river flow up higher and bring it to the top of the good farmland in an irrigation ditch to water the lands below. Now, this triangle of land is often an opening within a more hilly and forested landscape. So it's a clearing which is open and sunny for farming. So our little village here is above the floodplain, above the cold air drainage, and has a good vantage point over the whole area. So down from there, these two streams come together and they flow into a more narrow valley or canyon. Speaking of which, we come to our next bad location, which is in a narrow valley or canyon. In a narrow canyon, there are a number of disadvantages. First, there may be poor access to sunlight because of the steep hills on all sides. Second, in a major flood, there's nowhere else for the water to spread. And even if your house is out of the floodplain, the access road may not be. Third, in the event of a wildfire, depending on the wind direction, a fire can rapidly move both up and down the canyon or tight valley. So overall, it's a pretty poor location. Although, in a very arid landscape, a canyon bottom may be the only place where there's water. So, there are exceptions. And now, for number one, we're gonna look at the best place to place homes in relation to each other, which is to cluster them. You see, a lot of times when people get land and wanna have some sort of community or development, they have this idea that each home has its own little valley where they can't see any other people. And everyone has their own private little kingdom where they can look out onto unspoiled nature. But the more people spread out in this fashion, the less unspoiled nature remains intact. And the amount of roads, pipes, and other infrastructure multiplies when people spread out. So each home needs its own laundry facilities, energy systems, storage areas, workshops, communication networks, and a lot more. This pattern multiplies the amount of resources necessary for living and the amount of environmental impact. But when houses are clustered, then all of the infrastructure is lessened and there's the opportunity to share resources and utilities. There are less roads, less pipes, less wires, which lowers the cost of housing and the cost of living for those involved. When we look at any traditional village around the world, we see this pattern. And it's only the car 
with quick long distance travel that's made it possible for people to maintain lives spread out so remotely from each other, but the environmental cost is tremendous. If we expect the planet to maintain its growing population, then we have no choice but to enter a lower energy use future. So returning to our roots of clustered housing is definitely the best choice. So there you have it, the five best and worst places to build a house or village.